worship. Now just ask wherever you are and whatever you're doing, just stop for a minute and lift your hands. And let's worship God in this moment because he is so worthy. And we bless him. We give him glory because he's good. And his mercy endures forever. How great is our God? Splendor of the King. Sing with me. 
Praise the Lord. Good Wednesday evening. Thank and praise God for your presence again uh, here at The Life. And we thank God that uh, we have this opportunity once again to share the word of God. And we hope and pray and trust that everyone is well. And we know that you are because God is still sitting on his throne. And beloveds, you can trust and be assured that the purpose and the plan of God is working despite uh, what our experience is, is uh, we're having now. Uh, the plan of God is still working. As long as there is a people of faith in the earth, a praying people, a believing people, a trusting people, we can be assured that what God planned ultimately will come to pass. Well, I want to get back to what we uh, began to do our studies in last Wednesday. Uh, this particular series is called The Believer's Devotional Life. And uh, we were looking at Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, uh, verse 38 to about verse 34, where we were examining uh, two opposite positions, the two opposite positions of, of Mary and Martha. As you well know, uh, Jesus had visited the home of Martha, and while he was there, he was there ministering the word of God, and during the time of ministry, uh, Martha was doing a whole lot of preparation. She was uh, really exasperated by finishing the numerous household tasks uh, that she was preparing for her guests. And so she was really focused on that. And yet at the same time, her sister Mary, uh, she sat down attentively and she was absorbing all of the various revelation that Jesus was giving to those who had assembled at the house. And in the midst of all of that, we discovered that Martha uh, pretty much interrupted Jesus's ministry time. And, and this is what she said, and I'll paraphrase it, the, the Passion Translation says it this way. She says, uh, Martha said, Lord, don't you think it's unfair that my sister left me all alone to do the work by myself? And so here Martha is really concerned. She wanted everything to be in excellence, uh, which is a good thing. She desired that the meal be prepared properly. She wanted everything in place simply because Jesus was there. And I do get it. Uh, certainly there's nothing wrong with serving. But however, at the time of her service, the word of God was being ministered. And here's what the Lord said to Martha as uh, she brought her uh, request to Jesus. She, he said these words. He said, Martha, my beloved Martha, why are you upset and troubled, pulled away by all these many distractions? And so uh, we understood from last uh, time together that distractions can interfere with your devotional life. And certainly we understand the importance of a devotional life, and we'll get into that a little more in detail in just a few. Uh, and so he went on to say, Mary has discovered the one thing that's most important by choosing to sit at my feet. She is undistracted and I won't take this privilege away from her. In fact, uh, Jesus is really saying to uh, Martha, although you're exasperated about this, although you're upset about this, I'm not gonna stop your sister from sitting attentively listening to the word and gaining revelation. And so uh, Jesus actually applauded uh, Mary by saying one thing was necessary and Martha, or Mary that is, chose that necessary thing. And so here's the point as it relates to the believer's devotional life. There is a need for us to establish priorities. Nothing better than having your life well ordered and well organized considering of uh, the fast-paced world uh, that we're living in. And we'll talk a little bit more about fast-paced world uh, in just a moment. So, so whenever we are under the Word of God, the Word of God always brings us to the crossroads of decisions. Uh, we have to decide whether or not we're going to heed the Word uh, 
obey the word, or we can choose to not heed it and not obey it. Uh, Mary chose the greater portion of that. And so now, uh, as we begin to go a little deeper into uh, this series called The Devotion of Believers, like I'd like to read a few passages of scripture uh, that concerns Jesus's devotional life. And uh, the first verse I'd like for us to look at, you'll discover it in Matthew chapter number uh, 14. And I'm sure that you have your Bible there with you. Uh, chapter 14 of Matthew's gospel and uh, verse 22. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. And verse 23 says this, after he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. Now let's read another passage of scripture concerning Jesus' devotional life. And we see here from this passage that Jesus was praying right before evening time. And so let's go to Mark chapter number six. And I wanna get all these verses uh, in your spirit. Uh, as we begin to explore in more detail uh, how to have a devotional life or the importance of uh, having a devotional life, Mark chapter 6, and we want to look at verse number 45 to 46. And this parallels what we just read in Matthew's gospel. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead to, of him to the other side to Bethsaida, while he, he himself was sending the crowd away, after bidding them farewell, he left for the mountain to pray. And now let's look at Luke's gospel, chapter number six. And when you get to chapter number six, we want to look at verse number 12. It was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. There's something about Jesus and, and having prayer in the mountains. In this particular case, uh, prior to Jesus' selection of uh, the 12 uh, apostles, uh, he went into the mountain, he prayed all night. And what's interesting, if you read further in that particular passage of scripture, you will discover that Jesus picked 12 guys from the many disciples that had gathered among him. And so he really had to hear God clearly and specifically speak to him with respect to those that he would choose to be his leadership. And now let's look at Luke chapter number nine. And uh, when you get to chapter number nine of Luke's gospel, uh, let's look at verse 28. Some eight days after these sayings, he took along Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And here we discover that Jesus in this occasion took uh, three of his disciples with him. And I'm sure that they observed his praying. I'm sure that they uh, heard his prayer and he was not isolated from them, but it almost becomes a model for them as it relates to their own personal prayer life. And then one more passage of scripture, which is in the same book that you're looking in Luke's gospel. In fact, this particular verse comes right after the discussion between uh, Jesus and Martha as Jesus has visited her house. Verse one says, it happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. And here again, I believe that the disciples were captivated by Jesus's prayer life, or you could say his devotional life. And so uh, if we're looking for a blueprint a model or an example to follow concerning what a devotion will look like, uh, we could or don't have to look any further, or we can't find anyone better than our Lord and our Savior. In fact, here's the first point I'd like to make about a believer's devotional life is this. A devotional life is committed to God. A devotional life is committed to God. Jesus, of course, is the epitome of a devotional life, uh, all, one that exceeds all others. In fact, it, it doesn't matter uh, what our experiences have been uh, here in the earth with various uh, spiritual leaders in our lives, et cetera. And certainly I've been blessed to have phenomenal spiritual leaders in my life and still do. But uh, Jesus is second to none as it relates to the person 
that we can really look at with a view to understand the depth of a devotional life. So uh, again, that point is a devotional life is a life committed to God. What do I mean by committed to God? I mean, uh, it is being submitted and completely surrendered to God so that we're able to manage effectively what has been assigned to us or so that we can effectively manage our life purpose. Now, let's look at Jesus's life and uh, look at a couple of verses of scripture to support that point. John uh, chapter number four, that is the gospel of John. And when you get to the gospel of John uh, chapter number four, uh, I want to look at verse 34. And here's what verse 34 says. It says, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. And so here Jesus is announcing to the crowds what he's here for, what his goal is, what the primary thing in his life is. And certainly uh, with respect to that, Jesus had to have an amazing devotional life to stay in tune with the Father so that he would always know what the Father was saying and what the Father was up to. And let's water that verse with John chapter number six. Let's flip over in your Bible, uh, John chapter six, and uh, let's look at verse uh, 38. And here's what that verse says. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And certainly that's a valid point because uh, who better to talk with concerning life's purpose than the person who created us, the one who designed us. You and I have been designed uh, by God intimately. Uh, he even knows the very head, hairs that are on our head. He knows our inward parts. He knows everything about us, our past decisions, our present decisions, our future decisions. So who know, who is better than God to tell us and to keep us on point uh, with respect to our life purpose? So see, we, we discover in uh, John 4 and John 6 that it's, it's clear that Jesus was committed to the Father. And right now would be a good time in your life to, if you haven't, if you've fallen off, uh, recommit your life to the Father in, in this uh, pandemic time that we're in. A good time to reestablish uh, your relationship with the Father. And even if you're fully established in it, uh, let's be even further established in it. Jesus had to depend 100% on the Father in order to fulfill his assignment. John's Gospel, chapter 5, I'd like to take a look at that. And I'd like to uh, establish that fact that uh, without God, we can't fulfill the things that we have been created for. John's Gospel, chapter number 5, verse 18, we find these words. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Verse 19, therefore, Jesus answered and was saying to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son of man can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, these things the son also does in like manner. So Jesus, once again, uh, affirms his committed life to the father. And what he heard the father say, he would uh, become an echo of sorts to repeat what the father is saying. In fact, the earth now needs to hear what the father is saying. I know that, again, uh, we are hearing various news reports about Corona-19 and all of the things that are taking place, uh, the numbers of deaths and all of the the devastation that is taking place. But I will assure you that from the throne of God, the Father is not talking about death. The Father is talking about life. In fact, the word of God says, I am come that you might have life and that you might have life more abundantly. And so it becomes uh, paramount in this time that as uh, we are dealing with what we're dealing with, that our lives are 100% committed to God with the understanding that without God, we're unable to fulfill what he has assigned us to. And so that same truth is for us as well. 
in, in John's gospel, same chapter, uh, chapter number, not the same chapter, but chapter 15. I'm sorry, John chapter 15, let's take a look at it. And uh, verse one uh, says, I am the vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes it away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear much fruit. I'd like to think that this time that we're in is a time of pruning, a time of sharpening us, a time of uh, causing us to produce more fruit, fruits of righteousness. And certainly we expect out of this particular time that we're in a great harvest coming into the church, a harvest of souls, people uh, coming to the Lord, giving their heart to God, considering what has been taking place. Uh, verse three says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit for apart from me, you can do nothing. There it is. We recognize that without the help of the Lord, we recognize without the Holy Spirit, without the word of God, with, uh, without others of like precious faith to encourage, us, uh, to encourage us, it would be virtually impossible for us to fulfill the assignment that God has given to us. So developing a devotional life is paramount in this season a time where we wake up and begin our day by uh, spending time in the presence of God. But I wanna pause here for just a moment and I wanna consider a specific area. Uh, and certainly there are many other areas and as we go through this particular area, I'd like for you to think about areas in your own life that may have been a interruption or distraction or hindrance to your devotional life. There are many things that can crowd in on you that can now interfere with that. But let's consider for just a moment, we don't want to spend a whole lot of time here because uh, it can become a tremendous point of debate, uh, but let us consider the effect that social media has on a person's life. Certainly, uh, I'm not in any way uh, saying that social media doesn't have its purpose, not saying in any way that we shouldn't use social media. In fact, social media is, can be a great witnessing tool for us where we share the love of Jesus uh, more than we talk about uh, our own personal experiences. But sharing the love of God through social media can be a tremendous tool. But now, uh, with respect to uh, the human body, we have uh, a chemical that is found in the human body called dopamine. Dopamine. And what dopamine is, it is a neurotrans Meter. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter, meaning it sends signals or nerve impulses from the body to the brain. And so dopamine plays a part in controlling the movements of a person, uh, as well as their emotional responses. It is associated with food, exercise, love, sex, gambling, drugs, and now social media. The research that we are uh, receiving now indicates that when we're on social media, uh, dopamine is released in our body that makes us feel good. It's kind of like uh, if you put a posting out and uh, people have the opportunity to say whether or not they like it or whether or not they dislike it. But every time you receive a like, dopamine is released in uh, your body, which causes you to really feel good about yourself, praise God. But I want you to know that you ought to feel good about yourself because of God. Hallelujah. The main reason to feel good about you, independent of uh, social media, independent of any other substance or any other thing that makes you feel good, the main reason is because of the love of God. The Bible says it this way, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but that all should have eternal life. So even in our fallen state, the love of God has uh, addressed it. The love of God has met our need so that we can now reconnect to the Father. And so 
Uh, social media stimulates to the degree that we really look forward to it. In fact, uh, here are some statistics that are associated with social media. And uh, I'm sure there are more statistics coming out daily, but uh, here's just a few. Teens spend nine hours a day on social media. I didn't say nine hours a day doing research for uh, a term paper or for a given subject. Nine hours a day, teenagers are spending on social media. Also, children ages eight to 12 are spending about six hours a day on social media. That's a lot of time in a day that is being spent on social media. And then the millennials are spending 10% of a 24 hour day also on social media. And what we're discovering is that the percentages are even going up every year. So, so what am I saying to you? I'm not saying to you to no longer participate in social media, but I am saying to you that because of the need and the necessity to have a devotional life so that you can stay on track with the plan, the purpose, the intention that God has for your life, there needs to be the right balance. Hallelujah. There needs to be uh, a time set that you would set a certain amount of time for social media, but there needs to be the same. Just think about it. If you spent that same, uh, let's say, two hours a day on social media, if you gave two hours to God in meditation and prayer, could you imagine what your life would be like? And so in view of the demands of life, uh, the fast pace of life, the increased information that's taking place, the social media frenzy that's going on, having a devotional time with God must be given the highest priority. Praise God. In fact, in a devotional time, God can even tell you how much to watch television, how much to do this and how much to do that. Otherwise, without it, we're prone to go off course, get sidetracked, and perhaps mismanage the remaining portions of our day. I'm reminded of the writer of Psalm chapter 63, verse 1, of course, is David. And this is what David says. He says, oh God, you are my God. I will seek you early. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. And then in Psalms 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 3, it says these words, at each and every sunrise, you will hear my voice as I prepare my sacrifice of prayer to you. Every morning I lay out the pieces of my life on the altar and wait for your fire to fall upon my heart. What a powerful statement uh, from the lips of King David. In fact, let me read that to you again. I want you to just soak that in your spirit and see what David is really saying. He says, at each and every sunrise, praise the Lord. Sounds like David uh, is unwilling to start his day without uh, putting his petition before the Lord and waiting on the Lord to set his, his heart ablaze. At each and every sunrise, you will hear my voice. In fact, uh, I'm from this perspective that God is looking to hear your voice every morning, praise God. It's kind of like waking up in the morning saying, good morning, Holy Spirit, or good morning, Heavenly Father, or good morning, Lord Jesus, just as you would say that to uh, your loved one, or you would say that same thing to your boss when you, or a coworker when you got to your job, you would walk in and say, good morning. How amazing it would be to wake up in the morning and you say, good morning, Heavenly Father, and the Heavenly Father responds back by saying to you, good morning, and calling your name personally. So each and every sunrise, you will hear my voice as I prepare my sacrifice to you. Every morning, I lay out the pieces of my life. Praise God. He already knows your life anyway, so why not just be open and naked before him and lay everything on the altar? And then you will wait for the fire of God to fall upon your life. Well, I want to make one more point before we end our time together uh, this Wednesday evening. Uh, second point I'd like to make, number one, uh, a devotional life is a life committed to God. Second point is a devotional life prepares you for your day. A devotional life prepares you for your day. Now let's look at Mark's gospel chapter number one. Hallelujah. Mark's gospel chapter number one. And here's what it says. It says, 
in the early morning while it was still dark. Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. So it sounds like Jesus left the house because there were, I'm sure, other people in the house. You know, Jesus did have sisters and brothers, and he was the son of Mary and Joseph. So Jesus went to a place where it was just him and God alone. I want to encourage you that if you don't have that place in your house, mark a spot in your house where it's a time for you and God alone. In fact, I, I will assure you that if you will mark that place and you will continue to visit that place each and every day, you'll start to discover that when you walk back to that place or when you encounter that place again, you'll walk right into the presence of God because the Spirit of God will be there waiting on you, just like God did with Adam in the garden. He was looking forward to it. And I trust that you understand that God is looking forward to spending time with you. So, so uh, a devotional life will prepare you for your day. Here's why that's important, because each day is filled with its own particulars in spite of our routines. There are routines that we all have. We wake up, perhaps. We uh, prepare ourselves by getting dressed. We perhaps will have a cup of coffee or we will eat a meal before we leave our home for work. We get in our, our, our means of transportation, drive to our jobs, and where we now sit at a desk or wherever we may be working, we now begin to perform the duties of our job. If you have children, you'll drop the children off, etc. So there are specific and set routines that occur in everybody's day. However, if we will start that day, if we will uh, set our clock just 30 minutes early, praise God. I know sleep feels good in the morning. Uh, I too have been guilty of waking up and hitting the snooze bar to get that little extra sleep. But I'm telling you, uh, by experience as well, that when you start that day out by talking to the Lord, it just makes the day go better, praise God. In fact, we should approach life from a perspective of purpose and assignment. We should approach life from a perspective of purpose and assignment. So I want to end this particular session by looking at, real quickly, uh, Jeremiah chapter number one. And uh, this concerns the prophet Jeremiah, who at the time of this writing is a young man, but yet he's called by God. In fact, uh, God doesn't wait until you become an adult to determine your purpose. In fact, your purpose precedes you getting here. And here's what uh, Jeremiah chapter one, verse uh, five says, or let's go back to verse four. Now the word of the Lord came to me, that is Jeremiah, saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nation. So we discover from this particular passage of scripture that the father already knows us. And not only has, does he already know us, the father also has consecrated us. And he has appointed us for a specific task of which we are to fulfill in the earth. I want to just make sure you understand that it's not just for ministers. Praise God. It's Jeremiah in this case, but whoever you are is for you as well. Is that before you were born, the father knew you. And before you were uh, in your mother's womb, the father uh, consecrated you. He already knew the reason for your existence. It doesn't matter uh, whether or not you know your parents. It doesn't matter whether or not your mom and dad may be together, not together. None of those things really matter. What really matters is the fact that God made a determination in the eons of eternity that the earth needed you. That's right, yes, you. The earth needs you because you are the answer to someone's issues. You're the answer to someone's problem. And so having said that, it becomes significantly important to you to develop that devotional life where each and every day you start your day out by having some devotional time with the Lord, praying uh, your prayers and reading your word, and not only praying and reading, but listening to hear the voice of God. Praise the Lord. Well, our time has come to an end again, and once again, we thank and we praise God for your sharing in the broadcast uh, this evening. I hope and pray that 
this word has been an encouragement to you and that uh, your faith is steady being built. Praise the Lord. Just want to continue to thank everyone for your giving and want to encourage you in that. You know, uh, the Bible is clear that Isaac sold in a time of famine. Certainly, I want us to recognize that giving is always appropriate no matter the times, whether the times are good economically or the times are not good economically. Whenever we have to give, then we ought to give because the Father will give it back to us, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Feel free to use the Givelify app if you have it. Also, uh, you can write your check, you can seal it in an envelope, you can drop it off here at our church office, 25210 Grand River, and we will retrieve it. In addition to that, uh, if you'd like, you can also call our church office and you can leave your banking information and we can manage your giving uh, in that area. I want to end our time together uh, tonight with prayer. And certainly as we think about prayer, we know that God gave us prayer. Uh, he said in his word that uh, if his people were called by his name, would humble themselves and pray and seek his face, turn from our wicked ways, then he would hear us from heaven, forgive our sin and heal our land. We certainly know that the land needs healing not just America, but around the world. There is a need for God to heal. And we want to end this time uh, particularly praying for our brother Jerome. And we just uh, thank and praise God for his life. Praise the Lord. And we're not backing away from the enemy. We're not going to allow ourselves to, 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 to faint. We're not going to back away from our confession. Praise the Lord. We stand together as one voice before the Father. And so I want you uh, to grab someone by the hand if you're at home with someone. If not, just stretch your hand towards the screen that you're looking at and let's believe God. Father, we thank you again for our time together. Thank you for the word of the Lord. We thank you that heaven and earth will pass away before one jot or tittle of your word shall fail. We come today, oh God, this evening at the conclusion of this time, Lord God, to hold before you Everyone who is in our church family, Lord God, who may be battling any type of virus, uh, infirmity, weakness, injury, whatever it may be in the name of Jesus. The word of God says you were wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon you and by your stripes we are healed. And we declare that our brother Jerome is healed in the name of Jesus of Jesus. We know, Lord God, that there is no disease in the earth, that there is no physical trauma in the earth that is outside of the power of God to heal. And so we, we speak healing over his life right now. We, we declare him being raised up in the name of Jesus. We also, Lord God, uh, pray for Trey right now. We declare Trey to be whole in the name of Jesus. We declare him to be able to walk freely Praise God that uh, his brain functions normally in the name of Jesus. Any others, oh God, who are part of the life, Lord God, they may be battling anything. We pray for our brother Nate. We speak right now healing over him in the name of Jesus. We send the word of healing to, to Maddie and Nate right now in the name of Jesus. Be healed in the name of Jesus. We curse sickness and disease to the root. We command it to wither and to die. We stand in the authority of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we, we thank you and praise you, Lord God, for the report of the Lord coming back for us, enabling us to know, Lord God, that you have moved by the power of the word of healing and by your spirit in the name of Jesus. I pray over all of the lifers right now, every uh, member, every child, every young person, every man, every woman, every husband, every wife, in the name of Jesus. And I declare the blessing of the Lord upon all of us. So you said in your word that the blessing of the Lord maketh rich, and you addeth no sorrow to them. And so, Lord God, I even release a spirit of joy into our homes, O oh God, a spirit of peace into our homes, O oh God. We declare right now in the name of you that you are yet our king, and you are yet our God, and you are yet ruling and reigning over us. We declare that we are the head, we're not the tail. We're above only and we're not beneath. And we thank and praise you for it all now. It's in the matchless name of Jesus we pray. And everybody said, amen. Well, beloved, thank you again. We look forward to seeing you on another broadcast here at The Life. God bless each of you. Amen.